good seat. You never quote me exactly. Right. I don't know. That's the purpose of quoting. It's close enough. Uh, do you have? Uh, oh, I think I have your. Your. You want to one? Yeah. Well, no, no, actually, I'm fine right here. To the podium. Yeah. Well, take it off. Well, thank you, Roger. And it's it's really an it's honor. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to come down very much on Dr. Weinberg's side in this particular debate, uh, though I found much to agree with in, in Dr. Krause's remarks. Uh, I certainly agree that, that science is not the enemy of morality, and we have to make that clear uh, in a very public way, and I think our dialogue will go in that direction. Uh, it's also not even the enemy of mystery, and I think that is, is something we'll probably talk about when we talk about if not God, then what. Uh, but I'm very much a fan of construing this conflict between religion and science in zero-sum terms, because science is intrinsically the enemy of dogmatism. Uh, and there is nowhere in our discourse where dogmatism is more celebrated than in the discourse of religion. So I want to talk about this, this conflict and why I think it exists and why I think we therefore can't ignore it. Uh, but briefly, I want to say a few things about just what I think our our situation in the world is, because I really think religion is leading us to the edge of something terrible. Uh, and I think if you look at, if you read the news, if you, if you watch the news, you, you see that much of the world is over the edge already. 53% of the U.S. population believes that the universe is 6,000 years old and that we have no genetic precursors in the natural world apart from Adam and Eve. Uh, there was a, a study done in 34 countries uh, assessing the, the level of belief in evolution, and, and the U.S. came in 33rd just before Turkey. This is embarrassing. Uh, but when you add to this, this comedy of false certainties the, the fact that 44% of Americans claim to be confident that Jesus is going to return to Earth in their lifetime, uh, you see a, a terrible liability of this kind of thinking because when you, when you look at the, the prophecies uh, that, that describe these end of times events, uh, you see that it's not an exaggeration to say that something like half of the American population is eagerly anticipating the end of the world. Uh, I think it should be rather obvious that this kind of thinking provides people with no basis to, to make the hard decisions we have to make to create a durable civilization for ourselves, to make, to make geopolitical and environmental and economic policy that has a time horizon of not 50 years, but thousands of years. Now, many of these people are lunatics, of course, but they are not the lunatic fringe. I mean, we're talking about people who can get Karl Rove on the telephone on a weekly basis. Uh, and do on a weekly basis. We're talking about Christian ministers who have congregations numbering in the tens of thousands. We're talking about organizations that have operating budgets in the tens of millions of dollars a year, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, whose primary purpose is to spread this ghoulish expectation that the world is soon going to end in glory. We're talking about a group like uh, the Christians United for Israel, which is lobbying the White House and Congress at this moment to take a very hard line with Iran for biblical reasons. Now, it may be that we want to take a very hard line with Iran, but it seems to me uh, rather obvious that we don't want our religious maniacs pushing us there. Uh, we're talking about grown men and women with immense political influence who literally believe that that a confrontation of this sort would be a fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and they expect to be raptured into the sky by Jesus well, so that they can watch the rest of us hurled into a sea of fire. We'll go to four in the morning, but <laughs> and yet, if you can imagine it, um, I'll explain a little bit more after the, break. the picture is actually much bleaker in the Muslim world. Ready to go. And we, are, we are meandering into a global conflict with 1.3, 1.4 billion Muslims, a significant percentage of whom view every political and moral question through the lens of Islam, through, in terms of their affiliation with Islam, which is to say they will side with other Muslims, no matter how sociopathic their behavior, simply because there are other Muslims in, in conflict with non-Muslims. 
Now, there are many well-intentioned people in our society who feel an impulse to apologize for all, all of this, who, who think that all of the bloodletting we're witnessing in the Muslim world is a result of the, the militarism and the incompetence and the greed of our own government. Now, I, I'm convinced this is a profoundly dangerous misunderstanding of our situation for reasons that I, I spell out at some length in my first book, The End of Faith. Uh, and I'm convinced it's a misunderstanding even if we admit that our war in Iraq has been a catastrophic mistake, as I think it has been. I mean, w there's no question we have made enemies in Iraq. But there are enemies there that we have not made or not merely made. And, there are, and, and the enemies we have made, for the most part, we have made by virtue of their theology, by, by, by virtue of what they believe about the ascendancy of their faith and the, uh, uh, the one true way uh, to live on this earth. So this is the situation I think we're in. I think faith is playing both sides of the board in a, an increasingly dangerous game. And the greatest problem with the rest of us, with, with secularists and religious moderates and scientists, is that we find it very difficult to believe that people actually believe this stuff. So, secularists and, and religious moderates almost by definition don't know what it's like to be certain of God, to be certain of paradise, to be certain that the book they keep by their bed is the perfect word of the creator of the universe. And therefore they tend to discount the utterances of, of people who really are certain as propaganda, as, as, as behavior that's, that's really a cover for, for behavior that's being motivated by economics and politics. I, mean, I don't know how many more engineers and architects need to fly planes into our buildings before we realize that this is not merely a matter of lack of education or, econ or economic despair. So I, let me speak for a few minutes about how I view the responsibility of, of uh, science here. It seems to me that the responsibility of science and public intellectuals generally is to be honest. Because this really is a problem of discourse. This is a problem of ideas being systematically sheltered from criticism. So one truth, I think, in need of telling is this, that there really is a conflict between religion and science, between faith and reason. Because every religion is making claims about the way the world is. These are claims about the divine origin of certain books, about the virgin birth of certain people, about the survival of the human personality after death. These, are, these claims purport to be about reality. They are claims about what was and what is and what will be. And this inevitably puts religion on a collision course with science because these are claims made on bad evidence. And we don't have to distinguish hard science and soft science here. I mean, the, the, the core of science is not mathematical modeling. It is intellectual honesty. It is, a, it is a willingness to have our certainties about the world constrained by good evidence and good argument. Now, so science might not encompass all intellectual endeavors, uh, as Lawrence pointed out, but intellectual honesty must. And the problem is, it, the problem is not that religious people are stupid. It's not, the problem is not that religious fundamentalists are stupid. I happen to think you can be so well educated that you can build a nuclear bomb and still get, and still believe that you're going to get 72 virgins in paradise. That is the problem. The problem is that religion, because of it, it's been sheltered from criticism in the way that it has been, allows people, perfectly sane, perfectly intelligent people, to believe en masse what only idiots or lunatics could believe in isolation. I mean, if you wake up tomorrow morning convinced that saying a few Latin words over your breakfast cereal is literally going to turn it into the body of Julius Caesar or Elvis, you have lost your mind. <laughs> but, but if you believe that a cracker becomes the body of Jesus at the Mass, 
you, you're very likely perfectly sane. You just happen to be Catholic. But the, the beliefs really are equivalent, and they are equivalently crazy. So we do not respect stupidity in this country, but we systematically respect religious stupidity. And I think there's a basic truth about us that no double standard can, can erase. Either a person is being intellectually honest or he isn't. Either a person is willing to look dispassionately at the data or he's trying to, to conform the data to his prior conception of the world. And science, when it is working, which is to say when it is really science, amounts to a systematic eschewal of dogma. I mean, dogma in science is humiliating whenever it's recognized to be dogma. Religion really requires the opposite commitment. I mean, consider a few recent statements by the Pope. He, he, he recently spoke to a, a college in Rome where he observed that there were two dangers facing the, the faithful at this moment in history. Uh, the first danger is of a secular society that denies God and thereby, quote, disorients and obfuscates the correct conscience of man. Now, there is an implicit claim being made here, although it's, it's somewhat hard to make out. The claim is that human beings really do get their morality from religion. Religion, in this case, is Catholicism, obviously. Uh, and, in, and, and religion, in, in some sense, is the only source of real morality. Now, I'm quite uh, convinced that he is wrong about this, and one would have hoped that the, the legions of child rapists coming out of the priesthood would have given him some pause before making this claim. Uh, but I think it is the job of science and of intellectuals generally to really get to the bottom of what morality is, what it is neurologically, what, what, it, what it is demographically, the kinds of social structures that foster it. And I, I know we'll talk more about this. The Pope also warned against an approach to interfaith dialogue which, quote, weakens the essential content of the Christian faith in Christ as the lone savior of humanity and in the church as the necessary sacrament of salvation for all humanity. Now, there are several claims being made here. One is that faith in Christ is absolutely necessary for salvation. This, this makes one wonder just, just where, how far interfaith dialogue can go. Uh, but whatever we think of salvation as a concept, this kind of talk proves that the Pope and many millions of Catholics are fundamentally closed to any evidence or argument that suggests what is in fact likely to be true, that Jesus was an ordinary mortal, born of an ordinary act of procreation, and died like any animal. I mean, this, that, that fact, those facts, would be fundamentally corrosive to, to the belief system of Christians. 